You are listening to Proudly Resents. Oh, reason. I, I can't even I hear you. Well. Hi, this is Sam Wazel. Uh, proudly Resents. The Cult Movie Podcast. The Adam Biggest Men Show. To all you Proudly Resents listeners out there, just remember, you can't touch on hospitality. I want it. Prowler Resents, ProwlerResents.com. I'm with Chris Gore. This is Adam Spiegelman. We're in Chris's bachelor pad in Pasadena. <laughs> <laughs> it is kind of a bachelor pad, isn't it? It's totally a bachelor yeah, pad. Yeah, thanks, man. You get all your Batman stuff up. I don't think right. anyone would put up with that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. No no wife would put up with that. <laughs> no. So we're going to talk about the Fantastic Four movie from 1994, uh, Roger Corman film. It's like an underground hit. It's hard to find. We have it on our website. It's on YouTube. So really not that hard to find, but we put it up there. So watch it on what the hell. <laughs> so Chris, I just wanted to do a background of Film Threat and how you got involved in the first Fantastic Four. Movie. Yeah, I, I was actually uh, doing Film Threat magazine at the time. It was the Larry Flint incarnation of Film Threat. So um, like legit. It was legit. Yeah, it was at the time a legit magazine. And I was, I, I, Roger Corman was a hero of mine. Obviously, if you know Roger Corman's resume, I mean, he's an amazing guy. And he's got a great sense of humor about himself. I did an interview with Roger Corman for Film Threat magazine, and I got him to pose with a penny. So he's like, the photograph was really funny. I had this photographer take a picture of him. He's holding a penny where his eye should be, because the whole thing is, he's so he's so cheap. Right. Um, I was on the set of a movie called Carnosaur, which came out at the same time as Jurassic Park. And I did a bit part in the movie where I had like one or two lines. I was unloading crates of chickens. <laughs> And in, in it, I say, uh, can you give me a hand with these loads? So the idea was that he's going to put this dinosaur movie out too, right. and everyone would accidentally see it. Yeah, that was Corman's thing is like, you know, he directed direct to video was huge at the time. So his whole thing was he would do direct to video movies um, of something that was popular at the moment. So Carnosaur, he actually built a full size 30 foot Tyrannosaurus Rex, which in person was really cool. I do remember being on the set of Carnosaur and somebody getting fired because they had bought brand named soda. So <laughs> rather than getting like Papa Cola, right. you know, they bought Coke. And so that was considered a waste of money. Um, and I, I just, I thought that was funny at the time. And, and Corman being a hero, um, I got the op opportunity to interview him. I had heard that they were developing at Corman Studios via Stanley and and whatnot um, a Fantastic Four film. Um, as we know now, the intention was for that movie to never ever see the light of day. Yeah, right. So explain that. Why? Yeah. Why is that? The the idea behind this Fantastic Four movie is the German company that held the rights to the Fantastic Four had to have a film in production by a certain date, which was. I believe Christmas of 93, Christmas of 1993. It had to be, it's like December 31st, 1993. It had to be in production or the rights would revert back to Marvel. Part of the, and this is actually haunting Marvel to today, is part of what's written in those contracts is the idea that as long as the studios continued to make movies, they could continue to hold on to the rights. From Marvel's perspective at that time, they wanted to have their characters in movies. And so they didn't they care why they didn't care why. So they incentivized the incentive for movie studios was if you keep making movies of our characters, we'll let you hold on to the rights. Well, now that's come full circle to bite them in the ass where you have Sony owns the rights to Spider-Man um, and um, Ghost Rider. You've got uh, the Fantastic Four, Daredevil, although Daredevil, the rights actually reverted back to Marvel and they're now doing the Netflix Daredevil series. Um, so, so, so is that why Spider-Man got rebooted so fast? Yeah. Spider-Man got rebooted fast because Sony needed to hold on to the rights, which I think that, you know, a reason to make a movie is to tell a story, not to fulfill <laughs> a legal obligation. And, and yeah, to, I mean, look, they called it the legal obligation, amazing Spider-Man. Did they, yeah. The legal, yeah, exactly. The legally obligated to make this movie Spider-Man. Yeah, rather than the amazing part, which is which is what what's happened now with like X Men movies. Uh -huh. You know, the X Men and the Fantastic Four are the two big franchises at at Fox. I mean, you can Google and look up who owns the rights to what's, but but I think Marvel has done so well with their movies by having coordination. They've trained audiences now to stay until after the credits to now like just regular movies. I, I was watching Pacific I mean, Pacific Rim. I saw in the theater, mm -hmm. which I thought was a great film. 
And there's a scene after the credits. What happened? Uh, oh, you did? I saw the movie. I didn't know there was a scene after the There's a scene after the credits where, uh, you know the character that gets eaten? Um, played by... Uh, he was in Beauty and the Beast. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, yeah, Ron Perlman. Ron Perlman. Okay, Ron Perlman's character in a scene after all the credits have run, he pops out of the stomach and his character lives. Of course he does, because he's got to be in all his movies. Exactly. So if you just if you just like you know if you just watch that movie and saw it, it's like oh my god he gets eaten by a monster. Well, if you stay after the credits, you actually see Ron Perlman's and they character are a sequel, emerge. Though. They are making a sequel, which I'm I'm happy about. So, uh, but Marvel's retra- it's trained audiences to see like you know the, the idea that they have connections between the films. I mean it's it's brilliant. They have rewritten the rule book on filmmaking where these franchises now connect and you look at, I mean, there's rumors now that the Hulk will actually be a character in guardians of the galaxy part two. Oh, wow. um, guardian because Hulk can't be on its own. Well, yeah, there's probably Yeah. You look at even like the latest captain America movie mm-hmm. featured. We're really going off into a lot of tangents here, but the latest captain America movie also has Scarlet widow and also has Sergeant fury, Right. you know? So, so it's like, well, is there room for a captain America movie standalone? Maybe, but you know, it helps to have all these other Marvel characters have cameos. So they cameo in each other's movies. So it's like, you're watching one big story. And this is, this works so well in television when you've got crossover series and that, that whole shield thing that connected with captain America was shield brilliant. As a fan? I loved it. I loved it. I oh, thought yeah. it was kind of it was yeah. kind of meandering in the middle, where it was sort of like the you know monster of the week or the you know superhero bad guy of the week. But then when it all came full circle and connected to Captain America, was absolutely brilliant and affected the events in Shield, which will now affect events in Avengers Two, where Shield will not be really kind of holding the Avengers hand with having to deal with a world crisis. I think it's I think that's that's brilliant, but. So coming back coming back to the 1993 Fantastic Four movie directed by Oli Sassan, starring Alex Hyde White as uh, Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic. Um, so they had to make a movie. So they they, went to they, they had to make a movie, so they went to Roger Corman. Who can get a movie made for under a million dollars? And by, by under a million, I mean way under a million dollars. That's so funny because you read it says that the budget was a million, but there's no way that was. That movie was probably, the budget was a couple hundred thousand. Uh-huh. And it you looks know, every penny of it. It looks, yeah, every penny. No of lights, it. the costumes are rubbery. The, the, no, the, but this is the thing. I was on the set for most of the, the making uh-huh. of that Fantastic Four movie because the Fantastic Four was my gateway movie. I mean, uh-huh. it was it was a comic book. It was the movie, the, excuse me, or the comic book. The okay, sorry. It was the comic book that made me fall in love with with uh, these characters and and become a comic book fan, right? So just being a huge that that you know it was the Fantasy Four was the first comic that I you know read on a regular basis. So when I heard that they were making a movie, it was it wasn't Spider Man for me. It wasn't Superman. Even Batman at the time, I was a fan of the. TV series Batman, I ended up becoming a fan of Batman more because of the Neil Adams, you know, drawing Batman. Also because of, you know, The Dark Knight Returns yeah, written by was, Frank Miller. Uh, yeah. Batman Year One. I mean, that changed Batman as a character. I was not a big fan of the 1989 uh, Tim Burton movie. I was you not a fan of it. The problem was because Batman, we're going on a tangent. Batman. Well, Batman was a side character. That movie, the 1989 Batman is the Joker movie. Uh-huh. It is the origin of the Joker. If you follow Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, the things that happen to the hero happen to the Joker. Uh-huh. We see the movie through the Joker's eyes. We don't, we see the movie through the Joker's eyes and we see Bruce Wayne through the eyes of two reporters. The point of view of the film is from the reporter played by Robert Wool, not the point of view. The point of view is not Batman Bruce Wayne. Although I will say I love Michael Keaton's interpretation of Batman, the way he played, I'm Batman. I mean, it's well, it's amazing. He's like a regular guy trying to be tough. Or... Right, he's a regular. Yeah, I like it. So in a way, I like, you know, the Tim Burton slash Michael Keaton Batman of the 1989 movie better than the Christian Bale Batman where he sounds like he's got cancer. Rather than, <laughs> well, but, but, but I will say, I will say. the same thing though. They're doing that. Michael Keaton, voice. I will say this. Michael Keaton's the, the best Batman. Christian Bale is the best Bruce Wayne. Yeah, yeah. He, I, because, would, because, I think Val, Val Kilmer is the best. <laughs> well, <laughs> he, he wasn't bad either. The Batman Forever was not as bad a movie as people say. I mean, the whole subtext of that film is about that Batman's bisexual. 
Oh, really? Didn't pick those. The next one. Okay. Is- okay. We can talk about these subtexts and all this stuff. Things that I notice in movies that other people don't necessarily notice. But but the 1989 Batman movie is the hero's journey is the Joker mm-hmm. because you see the movie through his point of view. You see the tragedy. You feel sorry for him because you see what happens to him. You know, when he's sitting there being operated on and the doctor looks over at the tools and says, look, you see what I have to work with. These tools. I've made you into a monster. Um, anyways. So, so, so that, I mean, if you look at, if you look at, this is another funny, dumb observation. If you look at Star Wars episode one, the reason that movie is so unfulfilling is the point of view of the film and the hero, the character that experiences the hero's journey is Jar Jar. Uh Uh-huh. He <laughs> it's Jar Jar's movie. Followed Joseph Campbell. I mean, it's, 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 they, they meet Jar Jar. He, he's, 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 um, you know, exiled from his home. He comes back to his home as a conquering hero. It's it's all the things that that he changes. He's the only character that changes in any way, any dramatic way. Right, right. Well, that's what I felt with Christian Bale's Batman needed more Robert Wool. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, well, I, I I think Christian Bale's Batman, the, the the first one, Batman Begins as Bruce Wayne, is amazing because you then you really see the motivation. How did he become Batman? That story has never been told. And I know that Christopher Nolan said if you if you watch the extras on that that you know, four disc set that came out of all the, the, the Dark Knight trilogy, Chris Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy. His, his intention was for that movie to be uh, what Superman, Richard Donner's Superman was in telling the story. He said, that's never been told. He wanted to make like a big spectacle summer movie that told the origin of Batman, which the origin of Batman hadn't even been told in such detail in the comics. Uh-huh. There was The Man Who Left, which was the comic book that, that that Nolan grabbed a lot of material from. But he expanded upon that, went into some of the business aspects, how Bruce Wayne even like, you know, was able to hide manufacturing lots of, you know, the Batmobile. Well, you know, he doesn't just make the Batmobile. It was a military thing that was unused. I mean, uh-huh. it's a prototype. I mean, that's it's interesting the way he put that all together we are really going off on tangents back, here. Back, back, back back to fantasy I don't want to edit okay the show. yeah I now want to that, now that now that yeah <laughs> now that we've talked about all these good superhero movies let's get back to the fantastic four movie from 1994 um it was really to fulfill a legal obligation so they could hold on to the rights you know, but why are right, so what were they waiting for like why couldn't they have made a, a real mo- i don't understand like why well, they didn't funding make- a lot of movies now these days um the movie studios seek international partners. China has become a big part of how movies are funded. That's why you see so many scenes in movies set in China. They're trying to appeal to Chinese audiences. The latest Transformers movie, Age of Extinction, which uh, features the Dinobots, um, uh, I mean, that movie has a huge sequence uh, set in China. Because they gave them a lot of money. They gave them a lot of money. And they release it. Right, exactly. And it's and it's going, it's going so to go on time, to be one of the biggest box office in China. But, all right, so, but, but with Fantastic Four, these guys it, held it was the rights. funding, held the rights, and they could not put together right, the funding. The studios didn't want to make the movie, right? And they, the so studios. They thought, if we just wait a couple more years. The studio will come around. Right, studio will come around. We need more time to put the funding together. So who do we go to make a fantastic? And the 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 stipulation in the in the contract, the legality of it, is that they said it had to be in production. It never said the movie had to be released. It uh-huh. said the movie had to be in production. Or finish. Correct. Uh-huh. Um, they did finish a version of it, and you see, I think you know. Um, I mean, obviously, I've seen the bootleg of it, uh, yeah, yeah, as bootleg, everyone else yeah, has. Website, yeah. uh, but I was on the set during the making of it, and I remember feeling sad because why? Because Oli Sasan, the director, who was so sincere about making the movie, everybody, every every department, everyone. There was a when I wrote the article in Film Threat magazine, I interviewed Oli Sasan. I interviewed all of the actors. I did a photo shoot with the actors, which we ended up doing a cover story on Film Threat. This was all done kind of under the radar, you know, not with any Marvel, you know, approval. Roger Corman just didn't care. You know, he I, I, I was the kid that hung out at Corman Studios. Um, you know, I, I did this under the radar. I was taking pictures of my own. The special effects guys, uh-huh. which I knew personally, who built the Thing costume. Um, uh, it, everyone had this sincerity, but I knew deep down this movie was going to be a steaming pile of crap. You thought the movie was going to be bad or did you know that it was awful. Going to be released? Awful. I thought it was going why, to be why, awful. Why? I didn't know that it wouldn't be released. I just thought, but look at look at the trend. I mean, back then, Marvel movies were terrible. They uh-huh. were all the worst, 
right? Well, so it was Sergeant Fury, not to get on a tangent. Sergeant Fury. I mean, uh, the Punisher, Punisher, Captain America. You know, um, I mean, the Hulk on television with Bill Bixby was a highlight. But every time they try to bring in another character like Daredevil or Thor, it was just done god awful. Like they couldn't get. I mean, this is this is like an infuriating thing for fans. They couldn't just get the costumes right. Yeah. You know, it's a blue leotard with a four on it. And they're wearing <laughs> gloves. And in the oh. early comics, they have black gloves. And in the later comics, they have white gloves. Whatever, just any gloves. Well, then, and then even the cartoon, they got rid of Johnny Storm because I had read because he says flame on. <laughs> right. And they thought, well, that's a gay reference, so we're going to get rid of him. Well, even even with, um, you know, in, in which is the, the, the homophobia of Hollywood is just sort of stupid. Flame on, but then also they didn't, they were afraid that kids might take the example of lighting themselves on fire and thinking that All was right, cool. That- I believe more. It, right. But that, it was already in the Well, comments. I mean, you famously, Stan Lee tells this story. Uh-huh. Stan Lee tells a story of they didn't want Bruce Banner's name to be Bruce Banner because Bruce sounded made him sound like he was gay. Yeah. So they changed the name in the television series to David Banner. Well, that's what's so great about the uh, the really bad uh, Hulk movie, the Ang Lee one, was that his father was David Banner. Right. It's just right. A kind of like a fuck. A little, a little nod to the Bill Bixby series, which, which had a great score. Lou Ferrigno is oh, so it charming. Yeah. It was a good show. It was, you know, how can this mod, how can we get him mad? So the way to solve a problem is to punch something. Well, it's like something must show. be punched. Every show has a detective with one thing they can do well. And they right. Have, like the woman who remembers everything or the guy who can smell something. So yeah. the Hulk. I mean, you look at it now and it's cheesy, but at the time I lived for that Hulk show. Yeah, it, I that, lived that, for it. That's what it's for. It's for the ten-year-old boy. Yeah. So you can get that audience. So what? But so you felt the so, Fantastic Four didn't happen. Oh my god! I remember interviewing the guy who was doing the wardrobe, uh-huh. um, and he was so proud of this stuff. Proud of like, and it, they were basically just body suits with a four sewn on, uh-huh. and you could see how crappily. It was sewn on. And I remember when we were doing a photo shoot for the cover of Film Threat. And if you look up, uh, if you go to filmthreat.com, you'll actually find that issue. You could put it in your notes. Um, The issue of Film Threat with the Fantastic Four on the cover, it's free for download as a PDF. So you can read the story that I wrote. Um, And you'll see a picture of that costume designer. Um, The one thing that we had to be careful of, we were doing a photo shoot of the four actors in in their costumes. You could just, it was like visible camel toe. <laughs> the the woman who was playing um, Sue Storm, what was her name? Uh, Rebecca Rebecca uh, Staub. Uh, that that was her name at the time. I think she's married. Is a different name, but anyways, you could see her camel toe. I mean, it was just like the worst. Like it just they just they look dumb in these costumes. No matter how cool they tried to make themselves look, and you could see the actors sort of acting against all of the crappy. Uh, stuff that that oh, they, they were, were good actors. Yeah. Well, what was funny was Doctor Doom's lair was actually um, the sort of science experiment room from Carnosaur. So I'd been on the set of Carnosaur. Here it is, like months later. It's like you just redressed this set. And a lot of stuff that Corman did at the time was based on I've got a script, I've got a set, make a movie. Right. 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 Cheap enough. So he just recycled so many elements of that to, to make this film. And they had like 18 days to shoot it. So they shot the movie over two weeks, like partially over the holidays because it had to be, you know, by legal obligation by the end of the year. in production by the end of the year, 1993. Um, someone's actually making a documentary about the Fantastic Four. I think it might be, you oh, can Google it. It's called Doomed. Yeah. Doomed. I'll, I'll put the, um, uh, you're not in the trailer, by the way. I am in the movie because they interviewed me and I helped the director quite no, no, a bit no, no, in terms of contact. I was like bummed you weren't in the trailer. The oh, don't trailer worry about that. I, yeah, well, the the director sent me a nice note saying, uh, "Hey, you've got the best lines in the in the documentary." I I try to be funny and uh, at least make a serious point. Uh-huh. Um, Which is what? What did you think the point of that movie? Or what what point do you try to make? A, what did we learn from that film? We learned from that film a lot of stuff that I didn't know. That like that 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 you know. The print was burned. They didn't want anything to exist. It was, only so Sasan. Well, it? they never want. It was never intended to be seen by anyone. It was intended to a legitimate. And I guess Stan Lee actually visited the set, which I did not know. Uh-huh. Um, uh, at the time, I was unaware of that. Was he a fan of the of the of the making it? He here's here's the thing about Stan Lee. He's the nicest guy on the planet, uh-huh. and he would never say anything bad about any of his creations being made, even if the director was out to destroy it. But I think that like right now, what's funny is, is there's such a Marvel 
fandom that's grown up, the people who grew up as fans of Marvel movies are now making the movies. Mm-hmm. Everyone from like Joss Whedon to Peyton Reed. Um, uh, who's the guy doing the Galaxy movie? Uh, James Gunn. I mean, yeah. all those guys grew up with Marvel Comics. They're now making Marvel movies. Th- they're absolutely going to make sure that that stuff is translated correctly. Um, interesting side note about Peyton Reed. Um, of course, we all know that that you know they ended up making other Fantastic Four movies directed by Tim Story, mm-hmm. which I have no idea why Tim Story was hired as a director to make that film. Or what has he done before? He did the Barbershop movies, right? <laughs> he did? Yeah. <laughs> The uh, Ice Cube. Yeah. Uh, he made those movies. Yeah. Which I guess, you know, like, oh, there's a sense of family. But for me, it's like, I, I don't know. I still didn't see that that translated to making a, you know, sort of what, what at least in my mind, should be an epic science fiction movie. When I, when I, when I read the, con- the those early Fantastic Four comics, the three-issue run that's around like 49, 50, 51 in that span. I don't know the exact issues. Where they tell the story of Galactus with Silver Surfer. That is... When I remember reading that comic as a kid saying, I'll never see a movie with as good a story as that. It was like, and you can see where actually George Lucas ripped off Star Wars from that. I mean, this comic was written in the mid 60s and it's the story of Galactus coming to Earth with this herald, you know, tragic story of the Silver Surfer coming there basically to, you know, sentence to death. Everyone on the planet Earth because Galactus as this being needs to feed on the energy from Earth um, and just how that was all went down. I mean, you read the story and I get chills even just telling you about it. Uh I mean, that affected me so much as a kid. You can read it in reprints that the original, the first appearance of Galactus and the Silver Surfer is epic. It's it's an epic. And I thought that that's what the Fantastic Four movie would be. But it's... Even the first one. But the first one, the plot... The first one, it's it's around Doctor story. Doom, right? It's an origin yeah. story. And it kind of makes sense. It, I feel like the it, first movie... But it's movie, so done so cheesy with obviously no money to do it. It looks like shit. It but, looks terrible, yeah. But the plot-wise and the film-wise, I felt like that's so much better than the Tim story. It is better than the Tim story. At least it's more faithful to it. Um, but so, the so there is... Which that I thought was tacky. I didn't know that was actually real. Right, but it's it's it just it's interesting that everyone who worked on it they were so sincere. Uh-huh. There wasn't a single person who worked on that movie that wasn't just hoping this would be the best thing ever. Um, but I remember just this sinking feeling of sadness as I was on the set interviewing. I was like so excited, like you know, look, I I had only been on a few film sets at the time, and this was the one that's like this is the movie I care about the most, and seeing it like just so cheap. And there was a little hopeful part of me that was like, well, in real life, because I'd been on the set of uh, Army of Darkness, uh-huh. um, you know, Sam Raimi's the third and the Evil Dead films, and I remember walking through the set and everything looking so freaking cheap, like the the headstones on the graves were styrofoam. But when you see that movie, you can't tell that. Oh, you can it's, tell the people are wearing skeleton costumes. Well, okay, yes. There's some <laughs> cheesy aspects to it. I love Sam Raimi. Yeah, I mean, yeah. he's from my hometown, Michigan, you know, right outside of Detroit. Uh-huh. Um, and I knew Sam Raimi when I was going to college. He was this successful filmmaker uh-huh. at the time. He lent me a 16 millimeter Canon Scoopic to make a movie when I was in college. Wow. And I got to go by his offices and he'd call me kid because he'd always forget my name. Um, well, he had already made uh, Evil Dead 1? He had made the first Evil Dead, was about to make the second Evil Dead, and that's when I knew him. I was in college. He was uh, a few years older than me. Uh-huh. And uh, just the nicest guy on the planet. I, yeah. And he got it right with Spider-Man. I think that his incarnation, I like the first two Spider-Man movies. But the third movie. The third one, there are things I really love about it, and then there's things I don't like. As a fan of Sam Raimi, Raimi and Evil Dead 1 and 2, that's why I like the third Spider Man because he, well, he he just kind of was like we were talking about Tammy before the yeah yeah yeah, yeah. McCarthy movie we were like you're so successful do whatever you want and she fucks it up right he did the same thing they're like oh do whatever you want he's like, all right I'll do what I used to do well, with Bruce Campbell well the thing is yeah exactly I love it I mean there's like so there's so many good sequences in that that are comedic and I love Bruce Campbell's cameos in all those films uh-huh. um, but uh, in, in any case um, so but I remember being on the set of of Army of Darkness. And just seeing how cheap everything was, but then it photographed well. It looked, it's fine, okay, right. It looks like stone in real life, it's styrofoam. So I thought there was a little hopeful part of me being on the set of the Fantastic Four thinking it's going to turn out great. It's going to turn out great. And I and um, that summer at San Diego Comic-Con, 1994, we had the very first photos from the Fantastic. I mean, I, I scooped Cinefantastique magazine. I scooped you know, Starlog, I scooped Fangoria, like the big movie magazines at the time. 
um, that I grew up reading, I'd scoop them all. <laughs> and I had the cover story of the Fantastic Four. And not only that, we had a booth for Film Threat. We had the cast of the Fantastic Four. This was when Comic-Con was a small event. Well, I wanted to, I wanted to promote my magazine. Yeah, so you thought these people, everybody wants the Fantastic Four. Yeah, and I worked out with, I worked a deal with Corman's uh, publicist. We had a VCR set up with a two-hour loop, and I still have this VHS tape, of the trailer for the Fantastic Four running. I, I memorized in my head. Oh, because you've heard it like all day. I heard, oh my God, I, for, yeah, for four days on the weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So Corman gave you everything because it was free promotion for him. Yeah, and you I had I had 2,000 copies of that issue that we were selling at Comic-Con and we had the cast of the Fantastic Four signing. Uh -huh. So they were there, which caused a mob scene. Um, at the time, Comic-Con, think 1994 Comic-Con San Diego, um, was not a real sophisticated event. You know, it was just like, well, there's comic books and there's stuff. Movie promotion was not considered a big thing. We did them a favor by promoting the movie. I mean, um, I remember Stan Lee coming by the booth, getting him to sign a copy of, of the magazine for myself. I have a copy of um, the magazine signed by the entire cast. Um, and they were there signing it. And I remember how sincere they are because none of us had seen the movie yet. Uh -huh. We'd only seen the trailer and the photographs of the magazine. It was a very detailed story. If you download it from filmthreat.com and you you can you know you look it up that issue, um, you'll see it's very there's there's storyboards in there, interviews with everybody. I mean, I I I, I grew up reading a lot of these magazines, and I wanted to do justice to this subject. Even though you knew it was gonna be a terrible film, I. I knew, but there was a part of me that's always hopeful. It's like with the Star Wars prequels, it's like, well, maybe this is part of some plan. Maybe Jar Jar <laughs> turns out to be some, like, I don't know. Like, I'm always, the I'm. The next film, Jar Jar is very Right, right. Hello, I'm, people. I, I am the eternal optimist. You know, I'm not a, I'm not pessimistic about this stuff. I want to see great stuff. I want to believe that. That hiring, you know, the right people and the right that have the right mindset that they'll that'll somehow turn out good. Um, little little side note to that: I ended up running into Peyton Reed years later when they were making after Tim Story was making the Fantastic Four. Peyton, Peyton Reed. Reed did that movie, the cheerleader movie with Kirsten oh, bring Dunst. It on. Bring it on, yeah, which was great. Uh -huh. Heartfelt. Peyton Reed is directing currently the Ant Man movie okay. for Marvel. He's the one that took over for Edgar Wright when basically every director passed on it. Um, yeah, in Hollywood, but Peyton Reed is the real deal. He's a nerd that has been going to Comic Con for years, like myself. And I remember, I recall a conversation with him that a after the Tim Story Fantastic Four came out, he was up for the job to direct Fantastic Four. And I asked him, why did he not get to do it? And he told me that his pitch for the Fantastic Four, which Marvel passed on at the time, or the people at Fox, actually, not Marvel. Uh, passed on was his vision was for it to be set in the Camelot era 1960s, that it would be a period piece, that it would be based on the the vision that Stan Lee and Jack Kirby had for the Fantastic Four in those first hundred issues of the Fantastic Four, which is, which, which is this sort of Camelot era, you know, pre-JFK assassination, yeah, you know, height of the Kennedy. yeah, height of the Kennedy, like all that, like optimism, the space race, and it would be a period piece with the Fantastic Four being in the center of that. And what's funny is, is now they've gone on and like we've seen two different movies that are period pieces based on characters, you know, Captain Wolverine, Man. Captain America, X-Men First Class, like that concept stuck at Fox. And here they've done now three period pieces. No, well, Marvel did the other one, but they've done period pieces now. So that concept was really fascinating. Like you can do different types of movies using super uh, cost. Oh. Doing a period movie, if you just do a period movie that's not a superhero movie, that's expensive. Right, right. So they were looking to cut costs. And if you look at that first Fantastic Four movie directed by Tim Story, it's anemic. I mean, obviously not as cheap looking as the Roger Corman one, no, but, but it it's, looks so cheaply done. Half the movie takes place in a barbershop. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's awful. For, it's awful. Yeah. But but um, so so I, I remember that 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 was really fun with hanging out with the cast of that original movie, Alex Hyde White and I, I mean, we're still friends on Facebook. I think I'm friends with Alex Hyde White on, linked, on LinkedIn. Whoa. That's how like- Friends Friends, yeah, exactly. But so, so he you know- He played Reed Richards. He played Reed Richards in in that film. And um, he was kind of the closest out of all the movie ones because he's the oldest one I've seen. Even right. Though he was still young. This is why I'm so upset about the new incarnation of the Fantastic Four where they're all young. They're like the strike force. 
It sounds awful. I mean, everyone knows who's a fan of the Fantastic Four. If you've been a longtime fan of the Fantastic Four comic growing up, like I have, everyone knows that Reed Richards is an older scientist dude who's into young blondes. Right. Why can't they get that that right? <laughs> He's, a, he's an old dude into yeah. young blondes, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, And they've changed it now. My understanding, they've changed it now where it's basically based on Ultimate Fantastic Four. They're younger. They're like the strike force. They get their powers in the negative zone. I hope I'm not spoiling anything for you. But I don't think anybody is looking forward to a Fantastic Four movie. They've already, not only that, it's coming out in 2015. They're, they're, there's a, they've already scheduled Fantastic Four 2 to come out in 2017. Oh. Fox is trying to build a franchise. But Marvel recently is pulling their brand like any sort of license they're not licensing out fantastic four for and and their other marvel characters for merch uh-huh. right so so they're pulling back on merch for certain characters where they can legally they're basically trying to muscle these other companies into getting the rights to those characters back so marvel can do their their own versions do you think marvel can do a better version are you kidding yes i mean look all the marvel movies have not been great Right. There have been some ones that are better than others. But I don't say that you could point to a Marvel movie and, and say that this one's the bad one. They've been like they've they've learned their the lessons. Hulk? I'd say the Hulk. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That one. But the one with Ed Norton, I mean, it tried, you know, like that was the, the, the I mean, it tried. But I think it was the, from that first Iron Man. It sort of opened this yeah, universe. Yeah, Iron Man was great. The Iron first Man Iron Man movie. And the way that like, I mean. What is it like Kevin Feige, who's who's running the whole thing, the, running the Marvel movies? I mean, they've got movies planned through, I think I read 2028, mm-hmm. where they have like, you know, know different the phases. Kind of slots and yeah, the, the sort of like the sort of general, you know, like this will connect to this. I mean, Guardians of the Galaxy ties into Avengers 2, ties into, I mean, all these movies have some connective tissue that leads to the next Marvel movie. It's become this, I mean, I have to see a Marvel movie on day one. Why? Because I want to hang out with people that are like-minded, other nerds. I am a nerd. I, I am a, I've been going to, the first night and it was so much fun. It was so much fun. And, when you see, uh, John Favreau came out. Oh, was, was that the Arclight? Arclight. He oh. came out and he said, listen, I'm really sorry. Uh, for a while, you can only get midnight tickets. And then that day they released 10 PM tickets. And he said, right. I wanted to give you something special. And then Robert Downey Jr. came out. And everyone went uh, crazy, and I don't know if he said anything. Who cares? And then he, uh, John Favreau said, "Stay to the very end." So we all just sat and waited, and then because that was not that was the that was not a thing yet. No, he started or they started that. Well, it yeah, I don't know if it was even you know because the whole thing was is Sam Jackson as Nick Fury. But, like, that was actually kept a secret for a while. They filmed that scene, like, last minute, and it was just sort of very hush-hush. It did leak out. I think on Ain't It Cool leaked out that he's playing. Uh, but it didn't... It didn't, didn't make you sense know. if you watched the movie. Yeah, like, watch the movie, like, huh? But, I, 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 but it just... It showed that there's a bigger... There's something bigger at work. Like, there's all these... Like, it, it, it's basically Marvel planting a flag saying, okay, you liked Iron Man? We got more. And... Yeah. and uh so back, yeah. to back to back to Fantastic so Four. At that, that I'm at, I'm at Comic Con 1994 with with the cast, and and of course we've seen this trailer now hundreds of times. As you know, the, the two minute trailer played through the entire weekend as I worked the booth with everybody else. I mean, you know, for me it was just it was awesome because Comic Con at that time was not the clusterfuck that it is today. It's been in the last I'd say like seven eight years. Maybe the last 10 years where Comic-Con has just become not fun anymore. It's something I go to out of work obligation for networking and whatnot. And it is a place I see my friends from the East Coast. I'll see them. But it, um, it isn't fun anymore. It, it is not as fun as it used to be. I prefer to go so to... It's so Hollywood. It's so Hollywood. It is. Right? I mean, you just see... I, I, see yeah. all, I saw all the publicists that I would see at my job there with their clients. And right. That's not... Yeah, and they're like, what are you doing? Are you working? No, I'm nerding out. This is where you could basically just be sitting in the hotel bar and Stan Lee would walk up or Stan Lee would be sitting in a group of people holding court and and just you could just have a conversation. He was open to it. Oh, of course. Yeah, now he's got I mean I mean Stan Lee is Stan Lee. He's yeah. got handlers. I know I know his handler, Max, uh-huh. is his bodyguard slash handler. He's amazing, the coolest, he's the scariest dude. The scariest dude until you get to know him. I, I once interviewed, and now I'm, I've like 
because I know POW Entertainment and I'm friends with them, uh, the, the people there, Yuka Kobayashi, who works at POW Entertainment, and Gil and that that's whole team. Company. Yeah, that's his company to develop projects related to Stan. And I interviewed Stan in a public setting. It was the first time I interviewed him in a public setting. And oh. I was given these specific instructions. This was at Dragon Con, like four year, four or five years ago. Oh. And um, Max, his bodyguard, comes up to me and goes, okay, all right, you know, Stan... You know, he's a little older. He's tired. Okay. Just got to say, he's going to come out there. It says this panel's supposed to be an hour. It's going to be 20 minutes. You're going to ask four or five questions. Those questions are going to be approved by me. And you're going to, and I'm just being like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, I will follow your instructions. Yes, it's the great Stan Lee. Of course, I'm going to be respectful in everything you ask. And, you know, he's, he's a little tired. He's not, you know, we'll see if he's feeling it. But, uh, yeah. Just make sure that you do this. Like, don't don't follow all these rules I'm telling you. I'll be sitting in the front row. I'll be giving you signals. It was like this serious, like, wow. you know, as a TV producer, yeah, yeah. you get dressed down sometimes by, you know, talent representation. Yeah, but they're, they're more... They're more cool, except I think it was Stan Lee. I think Stan Lee and, like, Bruce Campbell, like, people who are that loved, and I, I think they've been taken advantage of. Right, that's true. And, and he is older, and with older clients, yeah. they do get like just do this and just do that. Right. Um, I interviewed Betty White, and they were like really on your ass about stuff, and she was amazing on stage. But we wanted to do, a, we did a funny bit where she plays password with Arsenio, and he would give her he would give her a hint, and then she would guess like the hip hop, urban, <laughs> urban slang version of that. So the first one was uh, something to do with weed or you know whatever joint or whatever the slang is. I forget. So the first one was like weed, and they said uh, no. She never does drugs at all. And another one was about like having sex. And like, she'll joke about dating Robert Redford, but she'll never joke about having sex. And you have to take that out. I'm like, all right, you know, that's her image. And they, they protect her a lot. And it was the older, you're right, older clients, they protect her. Well, what ended up happening was he really was just fucking with me. Once Stan Lee got on stage, he had way more energy than I had. He did a full hour. Oh, then forget what it I was, said. It's like, no, but what I'm saying is, is that Max was sitting there and he was just like, I, he, he would give me signals like when to be done. But, but the thing is, is that Stan Lee didn't need that like rap. It was basically, basically him doing a shakedown to like, are you cool? Are you cool? Okay, now you're cool. Now when I see Max, uh -huh. he's the nicest guy on the planet. He's the, I gotta remember, uh, I shouldn't even say this, but for one of the Marvel movies, Max showed me, he had Stan Lee's phone on him and he was showing me stuff he shouldn't have showed me. Uh -huh. But like, because he trusts me, right? I'm not yeah. going to blow it. You know, I'm not going to Which leak it to anyone. I can't say. Uh -huh. But it was one of the Marvel movies he was showing me on Stan Lee's phone. Is stuff that not out yet? I, yeah. But, I, but like showing me stuff that's so cool. I'd love to talk about it. I if can't. The number was after, would it be a three or a four? I can't say. I'm just saying that like, Max, one of the coolest guys, and I would never betray that trust, right? right, right. You know, like, I mean, you and I both know people in the industry, and, and, you know, there are things you know you can say, and then there are things that you won't say, because to me, the, my relationship with that person is more important. Sure. So, so... Um, Stanley, Hango, Comic-Con. It, it was just cool to have him come by. He signed a copy, you know. He's just an enthusiastic supporter of everything he does. He'd so never, say, like he'd never say a bad word about anything he was involved in. Although I do know from having hung out and talked to Stan that when he does those cameos, it's my favorite moment of an, in a Marvel movie. One of my th favorite things is when they do that little flip thing at the beginning where you see frames from actual Marvel comics uh -huh. and then Stan Lee's cameo, which is to me a requirement for any good Marvel movie. But they shoot multiple ones. Like wow. they shoot like, like different cameos for Stan Lee for those movies sometimes. Because he'll come out and they're like, they don't know how it's going to cut together. Yeah. Sometimes they'll shoot multiple cameos. There's a cameo that was actually cut from, I think it was, was it one of the Thor movies or Iron Man? It was either Thor or Iron Man 2, one of them, where um, this was cut, so it's never been seen. Mm -hmm. And Max told me about it. I think I can, I'm safe to tell you this. The cameo is Stan Lee driving a truck um, sees something in the road, you know, bumps over, sees something in the road, stops his truck, walks out of the truck, and there's Thor's hammer on the ground. And he sees, you know, he who possesses, what, what, is, the, what is the quote? Right, yeah, he who possesses a heart, blah, 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 going to have the power of Thor. So he looks at it, and the whole thing is no one can lift the hammer, right? right? So Stanley looks at it, reads the inscription, picks up the hammer, pitches it out of the road so it's not a danger to anybody else, gets back in his truck and drives off.
they ended up cutting that ca- that cameo, but it's been shot. But it's so, it's and it exists. Too, it's too it was yeah. It was. I think it's something that also Marvel fans would would complain about because yeah, like, yeah, yeah. hey, only Thor can lift the hammer. Right, right. right. I, I you would know? complain about that. Yeah, it, yeah. It takes you out of the movie. It, it, it takes more, you out of the more movie. Than the cameo. But I love. I think my one of my favorite Thor cameos was in the recent Thor two, Thor: The Dark World, where you see uh, what's his name, Stellan Skarsgård, the scientist, giving his explanation of what's happening in the universe, and then. Um, they cut to a wide shot and there's Stan Lee there. Can I have my shoe back? That's my favorite cameo because he's uh-huh. using his shoe to explain the scientific theory. So and it's fantastic for what happens next. Is the- what happens next is I remember calling Marvel or not, excuse me, Corman's company and asking, so when is the Fantastic Four coming out? You know, because one of the things we would do in Film Threat, we'd do a preview, then maybe like a, a, a review. And we had sort of a set way of, of the way we would cover films. And it just disappeared. It got, they went radio silent. You know, my PR contact wasn't calling me back. I was talking to the, what's going on? Is it ever going to come out? You know, 1994 sort of comes and goes and everything's just sort of forgotten. And then I remember hearing via Oli Sasan that it's like, yeah, it's not coming out. And then I, I'm, I get this, my gut feeling is Oli Sasan personally leaked it so that sure. it would be preserved. And bootleg VHSs, I remember getting a bootleg VHS of it and just thinking and watching it and just going, this is just terrible. This is just the worst. So it was just God awful. And I remember watching it and just like, God, we don't, I don't even know how to do a follow up to this. You know, is it worth reviewing? It's a bootleg, but it was unfinished. I mean, there were unfinished effects where you could see like, this is the place where you would actually put the, like them against a green screen, but nothing there. There's shots like that in the movie. There's a lot of shots. Or even yeah. um, unfinished shots. Johnny Storm's powers. Like, yeah. he doesn't completely become flame uh, fireball because it's too expensive. So his hand and his foot. And then the end is my favorite part of the film is that he finally sets flame on and becomes the human torch. And it's a cartoon. It's a cartoon. It's a car- it's a cheesy cartoon. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, fuck it. We're just I feel like in. I feel like Oli, just to sort of save his reputation, who knows, was just wanted to have a completed movie. So it was a lot of pulling favors. I mean, that's actually true even in, in you know, on a big budget scale with movies. Everyone working on them are fans. Uh-huh. You're not working on the new Star Wars movie to get a good paycheck. You're working on it because you can say, I'm working on the new Star Wars movie. Right. You know? So it's, it's, uh, I, 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 it's, it's, it's amazing that, you know, we've grown up and seen horrible versions of our, 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 our things we loved as, as yeah, Spider-Man TV show, you know, uh, whatever incarnations Captain of the America Marvel movies, the Captain America, you know, movie, like all these things were bad, but now the people making them are the people that grew up with them and love them. And that's why I think the quality has dramatically increased with these superhero genre, genre films because they're not going away. Fans are making them. I mean, ultimately, the new Star Wars movie, Star Wars Episode Seven, will be the biggest budget, probably most successful fan movie ever made. Yeah, sure because J.J. Right. Abrams is a fan. Right, right. No, but why so now, you- now it's sort of come full circle where it's like, these are fan films. That's why I think fan films are lati- totally legitimate when you see the fan movies that are made. I mean, I would love to see them go off. There was the guy who made that Batman uh, uh, movie that screened at Comic-Con and got like a huge, like a, a huge reaction. It was on a panel that I did. It was like a film threat panel years ago. Uh-huh. Uh, um, and Sandy, what's his name? Sandy. Nigar. I'm forget trying. I forget his name, but but he'd done basically what was this like test reel? It was like, oh my god, it's like an R-rated Batman movie, which I would love to see them do like spin-off films. Right. You know. Well, why do you think you, they couldn't release a low budget, shitty Fantastic Four? I think I think the production company did not want to devalue the brand. I mean, brand is something that people talk about a lot in marketing and a lot in especially film stuff. Brand is important, and you devalue the brand. You have one bad. You know, look, if this first Star Wars movie is bad, that's it's it's going to be yeah, a long up, six years. We put up with Jar Jar. Binks. Well, that's true. Yeah. For two that's more films. True. Right. And no one. Want, so many people saw all three of them. Right. I think I was the only person who said I'm not. You saw all three of them. Even though you hate yeah. Wait, right? did you not see the last one? The last one was no, the best. Was only because I reviewed it for the show, for the podcast. Right, Otherwise, right. I never would have saw it. Wait, wait a sec. Proudly Resents did Revenge of the Sith? We did uh, Podcrawl. We did two with two other bad movie podcasts with uh, Read It and Weep 
and oh nice out. so each one of us did a uh, oh that's cool three. man yeah so they got to do the first two i got to do, i think the best of the three i think i don't, I don't think i've ever seen the well second yeah one. revenge of the sith is the best of the three i'd say the worst of the three is the attack first of the one. clones no the first one is not nearly as bad Oh, I never saw because that. the second one is this sort of forced romance that's so poorly written. I mean, it's like I remember people just snickering and laughing in the theater, which is so god awful. Well, it's written by George Lucas. It's not right. Really- I don't know why he will spend tens of millions of dollars on special effects, but not pay a screenwriter one million dollars to write a screenplay. Right. right. Ugh, writers always get. Do you think he writes? Them, or do you think he does? He have the ghostwriter? Uh, there, there. I know that the people did help him. Yeah. But he certainly chose the wrong people. Right. Or he chose the wrong things from them. Yeah. Right. And so the new Fantastic Four. The new Fantastic Four is shaping up to be pretty bad, in my who, opinion. Do you know who's in it? Do you know? Uh, it's it's a cast of uh, unknowns, all young. I mean, we can look it up on IMDb. But oh, so it's out there. It's it's out there. No, it's, it's in production right now. Because I had read that there was like a bunch of good looking kind of famous. Good looking. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, I mean, not, I mean. Not fa- not famous in terms of stars. No, not like stars. The guy from, but they're uh, all like young. Well, the one girl from House of Cards, she plays Sue Storm. All right, that's wrong. She's a great actress and she's hot, but I don't know if that's who I would pick. Uh, exactly, Two, exactly. Two thousand fifteen. All right. Yeah. Kind of well, so it's coming out in two thousand fifteen, and it's really based on Ultimate Fantastic yeah. Four. Michael they... B. Jordan, right? Johnny Storm. Right. He's a great actor. He's black. His sis- Sue Storm is white. In the, the woman playing Sue Storm. Why yeah. did you make them both black? I, I, Why I, I, did you put the, the hot actor of the moment in there? It does seem pandering. It's pandering. Um, they, they're brother and sister. Just make them both black. Make all four of them black. Who gives a shit? It could be adopted mixed family. Who knows how they'll explain it, it. It doesn't... It just seems so happy. They just put in... Well, like you said, it, the hot person of the moment. She's on a house of cards. Right. They just did Fruitville Station. So, right. Um, and Reed Richards is 12. Right? Yeah. He's just a young... Yeah, like he's a young dude. Yeah. Uh, he was born in 1987. <laughs> <laughs> I think you had started Film Threat by 1987. Uh, yeah, 1985. I started wow. Film Threat. Yeah. Proudly Resents, ProudlyResents.com. You can listen to Chris Gore's podcast, uh, Pod Crash. We're on it a couple of times. And yes. A lot of old. He goes to other people's podcasts and just pretty much takes their audio. You can, you can get the Pod Crash app. It's free. Great. Just look up Pod Crash for Kindle, Android. Uh, everything all the food iphone ipad all that stuff and then your book uh celebrities poop how do we find that my book and comedy album celebrities poop you can just go to celebritiespoop.com or you can download my comedy album on itunes or amazon it's great and uh this proudly resents uh at proudly resents is our twitter and we tried advertising before it never really worked so but i believe in the show and so do you that's why you're listening this far so donate i had to get new microphones because my microphones got ripped off from my car Nah, not much fun. So, <laughs> and I'm having a kid, so we'd still need to buy a lot of stuff. So that's where the money is going to go. And you can say where it should go to microphones or the baby. And I'm not going to judge you either way, but <laughs> let us know where you want the money to go. And you can find that link on proudlyresents.com. There'll be a button if you hit it. It might be a picture of my cat. I'm not sure. <laughs> Adam, we're, we're out of time for this interview. Thanks for listening to Proudly Resents. Make a comment or suggest a film at reachadam at mac.com. Join us on Facebook or be old school and go to our website, proudlyresents.com. If you like the show, put the episode up on your Twitter, Facebook, stumble upon, dig, you know, all those things. Tell a friend, I'm Eddie Pepitone, and my Twitter account is at Eddie Pepitone. Holy shit. Well, let's talk about the film threat real quick. Sure. How did you start that? And wh- wait, I remember, wait, you want to get into that? I, oh, I got to get myself, I got to pour myself another drink. Though. All right. I got to pour myself another drink. I think that's a whole, that, is that all other, that's a whole other podcast. That's well, a whole other podcast. We'll, well, the next episode you hear will be Chris talking about Film Threat Magazine, which is a big deal, a big deal in my life.